please help me make some noise for Pastor Mildred. We can do better than that. We can do better than that. It's giving. It's giving. It's giving. Praise God. It's very weird to have people read, talk about you when you're in the room. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. Um, it's an honor to be here. Please be seated in God's amazing presence. The presence of God is so strong in this room. Um, so it will make my teaching easy. Um, thank you, Pastor Sam. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Celebrate him. It's, it's so good to be with you. Um, we had an interesting time on the IG Live, and so I was looking forward to this. Ezekiel and Kiana, it's so nice to meet you guys in person. So nice to meet you in person. Where's Yeka? How many of you were, oh, how many of you were blessed by Yeka's worship? We used to have Yeka do that with us every Sunday until she left us and moved to America. So we miss her, but I'm glad she's doing great things. Um, Pastor Daniel, I wanted to greet you, but I'm not very happy with you. Mm -mm. I don't understand what you were doing right there. If the Holy Spirit gave you my message, why didn't you say no, it's not fair on her? I'm like, what's that? What's that, sir? But was he phenomenal or what? Yeah. Pastor Chris, has Pastor Chris left the room? He stepped out, okay. We can all tell that's Pastor Jerry's son, right? Talks like him, acts like him, has his mannerisms, his own, it's, no, that's too much. <laughs> too much. And Camden, you brought it, girl. I could see her face change when they were talking about m women doing something. She just goes, I'm like, Pastor K, she's about to bring the fire. <laughs> okay. Um, I will preach what's left of my message that Pastor Daniel did not <laughs> preach. But please, in the future, avoid me. <laughs> if you are speaking before me, tell them no. <laughs> um, okay, so interesting, I had this whole message planned out. Please, I need a timer because I can speak for three hours and not know it. Um, where? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so I had this whole thing planned out. I was just going to do something quick, sharp, and just get out of the way. And during the worship, the Holy Spirit taught my notes. Um, and so I'm just going to address some of the things that I think God wants me to address today. Um, first thing I want to start with is the fact that marriage is not a reward. I think you need to tell the person sitting beside you that marriage is not a reward. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I think that a lot of people idolize marriage and make it seem like you get married as a reward from God for being an amazing person, for praying a lot, for studying the word, for being so well behaved. And that is such a big lie. Almost all of us, let me speak for myself, all of us that I know that are married, the Lord is helping us. It's not like we're okay like that. It's just the Holy Spirit. <laughs> It's just the Holy Spirit that is helping us every day and saying, no, that's not good. Go back and apologize. No, don't act that way. Okay, sulk. When you're done sulking, let's have a conversation. You know, so when people say things like, oh, you have to be a strong Christian, you have to be. So why are unbelievers getting married? So marriage is not a reward. But marriage is an assignment, though. God wants to partner with you so that you can work with him to help his son or his daughter fulfill destiny. So when God gives you the privilege, and it is a privilege and a gift of marriage, he's asking you to join him to make someone else's life better. Now I know that sometimes we make it sound like marriage is work, 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 work. You know, you must follow God. You must do this. You must find out what God's plan is. And yes, that's true. But I also seriously believe that God wants you to enjoy your marriage. I don't think God wants you to endure marriage. It's something you're going to do for the rest of your life. If he's such a loving father, then he wants you to enjoy your life. After all, Jesus came that you would have life, enjoy that life, and live that life till it is overflowing. It's it's, an, it's, it's an enjoying your life every day. That's what he came for. 
So if he, he wants you to be married, he wants you to be happily married. But even though I've said that, I also want to put someone at ease. There's a scripture that I stumbled on a couple of years ago, Matthew 19. I read from verse 11 to 12, the message translation. And someone asked Jesus about marriage. And Jesus said something. Jesus said, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. He said, it requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage is not for everyone. Some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought. Others never get asked or accepted. So not everyone will get married. And you know what? That's okay. I know it doesn't sound like that, but it's okay. And the truth is, the sooner you are at peace with that, the better for you. Because I find like a lot of people are frustrated chasing marriage and we forget to live life. So whatever season you find yourself, whether you are single or married, enjoy that season. Half the time, single guys or single girls are trying so hard to get married that we're doing everything and we're missing the opportunities that being single brings. Being single is amazing. I think it's the only time you can just grab a backpack and travel without having to ask anyone or have to calculate the money or have to you know, do a budget. Imagine traveling with kids. There was a time when all my children were under five. I remember those trips were hell. So, <laughs> so I would have the double strollers for the five and the three, and then have the two-year-old strapped in front of me. And then when they started growing, when they all knew they could run, I used to watch movies when I was younger, and I would see, forgive me, this is not me being racist or anything, please, never. But I would see white people strap their children, like with those leashes, and I'll be like, how can? Africans will never do that. <laughs> Let's just say I had three leashes. <laughs> because my husband was not going to give up traveling, and we wanted to do it as a family. But life gets so hectic when you're married. When you're married, you divide your time into two. And then after that, every child you have, you divide it by that child as well. So Ezekiel and Kiana? <laughs> but Jesus also said something. He said some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons, like Apostle Paul, for instance. But if you are capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, Jesus says do it. So marriage will stretch you. Marriage will pull on your character. And I think that's one of the most amazing things about marriage. Because for you to be, for you to, to do marriage right, you have to first be the right person. And we see that with Adam. Adam's wife was brought from inside him. And when I read that scripture, I asked myself, as a man, for instance, and I think it starts with the men. As a man, if they were to bring your wife from inside you, would you be pleased with what God will present to you? I'll let that sink for a bit. And so when I coach single people, one of the first assignments I give them is this. When you want to get married, I want you to do a list. Take out a sheet of paper and at top of that list, write qualities I want in the person I want to marry. And then I want you to go crazy. Write anything you want. Must be rich, must be tall, must be handsome, must be spiritual, must pray in tongues 50 hours a day, even though they're only 24 in a day. Just write whatever you want on that list. And when you are done, strike off that thing and put your name on top of that list and ask yourself if you're all those things. Because it's easy to want something from someone else, but are you ready to give it? Because marriage is always about what you can give, not about what you can get. So the first thing that will help you in your marriage is to be the right person. To be the right person. The second thing is to choose the right person. You can be the right person, but if you choose the wrong person, you still have a terrible marriage. When I was growing up, um, I always had my head in a book. I was one of those nerds. 
So I, I, I don't ride a bike. I don't do anything outside. I don't, I don't swim. I don't, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it. But I always had my head in a book. So when everyone was learning those things, going outside to play, I was always inside the house. And so even in the kitchen, my mom wanted me to learn how to cook, but I always had a book. So I would have a book and stare, whatever it is shows. A lot of things got burnt anyway, by the way. So I remember the first time she was trying to teach me to make an omelet. And my mom told me there's a rule to making omelets. If you're making an omelet that is more than one egg, you take two plates. You break the first, thank you. <laughs> Okay, yeah, this is good. So you break the first egg in that plate. You break the second egg in the second plate, and if it's good enough, you toss it into the first, with the first egg. You break the third egg into an, a, that clean plate. If it's good enough, then you toss it into... So pretty much the idea is you have to make sure that all the eggs are fresh before you put them in together. But of course, what do our parents know? So I decided to do it my way. First of all, if I use one dish, it means I only do one dish. I don't have to wash more than one. Very smart, right? So I did the first one. Second one, I mean, it was good. Third one, in the same dish. Everything was fine until I did the fourth one. It was a rotten egg. And you know what that meant? It meant a rotten omelet. So no matter how good you are, it takes another good, godly person who understands godly principles to have a godly marriage. So there's nothing like, I can cover for this person. Or I can help them. I hear people say, oh, this person is an unbeliever. And, and I can marry them. It's fine. I will change them. How many times have you wanted to change something about yourself that you've not been able to change? So why do you think you can do that with someone else? I think that as Christians, one of the things we need to understand, right, is the fact that when you get born again, in fact, I think the problem really is that most of us don't understand what it means to be born again. A lot of times we think that that's what Jesus came to do, that Jesus came to make us born again. No, Jesus came to introduce us to a kingdom. And the only way to be a part of that kingdom is to be born again. So when Nicodemus went to him, he was telling Nicodemus that you were born first as a natural person. And you know, it's interesting. Nicodemus said to him that nobody can do the things you do except God is with him. And he said to Nicodemus, you're missing the point. It's not about what I do. It's about who I be. So you must first be born again before you can see or do the things that I do. For you to have a godly marriage, you must first be born again to be godly. So what, is, what is Jesus was saying was, you need to be a part of our kingdom to behave the way we behave in this kingdom. I can tell you for free that if you are American, when you meet an American, you will know, right? You know I'm not American. Because by the time the anointing hits now, PG English will come off my mouth. Do you understand? And, and, and the Americans in the room will be like, what did she say, what did she say? But the Nigerians know that what I said has deep meaning. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the same way. If you see a Nigerian, you know a Nigerian. Pastor and I were in Paris a couple of years ago. And you know there's this train that runs through Charles de Gaulle Airport that just takes you from terminal to terminal. You're all looking at me because Americans will travel. You guys are so full of yourselves. Like, <laughs> we have everything in America, so what are we going to do in Europe? That's why I'm asking you now. Do you know the train? You didn't know it now. <laughs> I'm kidding, guys. So... We got to the, to, to the terminal, and we got to the train, train station, the train stop. And that train goes, I think, every two minutes. Every two minutes. comes every two minutes. So when we got there, we were too late. The door was just closing. So we decided to wait from behind. I don't know whether it's from behind. I felt like the guy flew over Pasuke and I, and almost killed himself trying to get into the train. And the, the train just closed, just just an inch from hurting him. Do you know where that man is from, Abby? He's Niger Nigerians know he's Nigerian. <laughs> Only a Nigerian would do that. If you are driving on the road, you can't get in front of a Nigerian in Nigeria. It's not done. The Nigerian will act like if you get in front of me, the road will end. You take the road with you where I'm going. <laughs> They're always in a hurry. Just two minutes. 
And I knew instantly that that guy was a Nigerian. How did I know? Because I'm a Nigerian. It's the same way people ask all the time. Uh, how do you know good Christian girls in church? Are you a good Christian boy? If you're a good Christian boy, you will know a good Christian girl. You know, so many guys pretend these days. Are you a pretender? If you're not pretending, you recognize who is not pretending to. And so when Jesus said, you need to be a part of our kingdom to be able to act the way we do in the kingdom, that's what he came for, to reintroduce us back. Because when, when God wanted to expand his domain, he created the earth. And he put Adam there, and Adam messed it up, right? But Jesus was saying, you can get it back. By being born again, then you can be a part of our kingdom. Now, what you must understand about the kingdom is that a kingdom has constitution. The way we have a king, we also have a constitution that tells us how we act, who we are, what we have, and what we can do. And one of the things that our constitution tells us, if you are a kingdom citizen, that's if you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, if you are not, then please, I'm not talking to you. Just ignore everything I've said so far and anything I'm going to say after this. But if you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, it clearly tells us that we don't cross breed in this kingdom. You must marry another kingdom citizen. I hear Christians all the time say it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Are you serious? You think it really doesn't matter who you marry? The Bible tells us that the one thing God wants from you is godly seed. It takes two godly people to raise godly seed. Listen, godly seed, not well-behaved children. Not well-mannered children. Not polite children. Godly seed. Children that know that they can engage heaven when there's a challenge. And that's why parenting is such a big deal. And I think that's why Pastor Daniel kept talking about it over and over again. And I still haven't forgiven him, but God will help me. He kept talking about it because... That's, the, that's like your, your report card as a Christian, as a Christian couple, that you can continue expanding the kingdom of God. You know, there are two ways to, to fill any kingdom. One, by conquest. So maybe by evangelism, because of the lack of a better word. You go out there and you preach to people and get into the kingdom. But some of us are born into the kingdom. So you can have children that you can lead to Christ and cause, cause them to have an environment where it's easy for them to know Jesus for themselves. And that's really what God is after. He's saying you can continue to expand my kingdom. Because you see, children learn more from what they see than what they hear. So your children are watching you. And you're saying, I don't know why this child never wakes up on time. Do you wake up on time? I don't know why the children are not reading anymore. You're always on your phone. That's why they're not reading anymore. They're not reading because they're not seeing mommy and daddy read. And so if we really understand what God wants from us, then we understand that marriage should not be taken lightly. I watched a series a couple of years ago that changed my life. And I've preached this in many places. Um, I, love, I love all these medieval dramas and all these medieval series. So I always like things that show you the kingdom. I don't know, maybe because it helps me understand kingdom better. You know, we're all born into a democracy, so most of us don't even know anything about how kingdoms run. So I watch a lot of those series. And there's this particular um, prince. His, his father wanted him to marry. So they, they used to marry to, to, to strengthen kingdoms, right? So they would marry into a kingdom to make that kingdom stronger. So I can't remember whether it was the British kingdom that wanted to marry someone from Spain. I can't remember. I wanted to marry a princess from Spain or something. And then at some point, the princess, the princess father was defeated and that, that kingdom now submitted to another kingdom. So of course, the British, the king of the, the British king now comes and says, oh, you can't marry that girl anymore. Their kingdom is not so strong anymore. And so the boy and the girl who had fallen in love, by the way, were having a conversation. And the boy was telling the girl that my father would not let me marry you anymore. And the girl was crying. And she said, don't you love me anymore? And the boy answered her. He said, I love you. But don't you know that marriage is not about love? It's for God, for kingdom, and for duty. My mouth was wide open. I was like, unbelievers understand. This was not a Christian series. This is normal kingdom. He understood that marriage was not just about love. 
He said, I love you, but I have to first think about God, kingdom, and duty. That's how believers should marry. I'm not saying don't be in love, but ask yourself, is this what God wants for me? Will this expand our kingdom? I know strong Christian girls who have sold their destiny on the altar of marriage simply because they want to be Mrs. Someone. They will marry a Muslim, take off the glory of God and wrap themselves with something else simply because they want to be referred as Mrs. And you have thrown away everything that God called you to do. When God calls you, it's not a joke. It's for God, for kingdom, and for duty. When I met Pastor K, interestingly, Camden asked me that question today. How did you meet? I gave her a very abridged version of that story. When I met Pastor K, I was already in a relationship. I've dated the guy for five years. We were engaged to be married. I was wearing an engaged ring. We had done introduction. You Americans, you don't understand what I'm saying. We have done knocking on the door. <laughs> As, ask a Nigerian, there's a Nigerian room, just ask them, what does that mean? Because we have, if you're from the Igbo speaking part of where I come from, we have like four stages before you now get married. So they came and they knocked on, they, they done the, oh, we, we saw a flower in your, in your garden, all those weird things. <laughs> and so families had come together, oh, we want to be friends so that one day we might pluck the flower in your garden. Flower be me, by the way. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we were on the verge of you know, taking it to the next level to get married. But we decided that we'd take one year and he would go to the UK and do his masters. I would stay in Nigeria and do my masters. And then when we're done, he would come back home, we'll get married and then we'll both move to the UK. Solid plan. Oh God, you guys don't even understand. It was a solid plan. And again, that meant that we would start spending British pounds, pounds sterling. Pound sterling to the Naira. Do the math. So I had a plan. And then I had a medical condition where they had told me I wouldn't be able to have kids. But this guy was a doctor. Solid plan. Somebody say solid plan. <laughs> so a doctor in the UK spending the only currency that has a surname, by the way, and then a doctor. Solid plan. So he went to do his master's, I was back home one day. I was going into the bathroom to take a shower, I was about to go to school, and I heard the Lord say to me, I want to speak to you. Now you must have a relationship with God. That's the only way to get it right. The only way. And so I left everything I was doing, went into my room, and I was worshiping God, and there's this song that came up on my CD player. It's very, I'm going to give you a very abridged version of this as well. And the song that was playing was Donnie McClurkin's I Will Trust You, Lord. And at the beginning of that song, it says, what if I ask you to let go of the very thing you hold so dear? And I was singing, yes, I will trust you, Lord. I wasn't paying attention. You know those, how you sing refined by fire? I want to be trying. You're not paying attention. That's it. So there I was, not paying attention. I say, yes, I will trust you. I was even adding to the song and everything. And then after that, I began to read the Bible because the Lord speaks to me clearly through the word. That's why I love the word so much, by the way. So I opened the scripture about the woman at the well having a conversation with Jesus. And then Jesus said to her, go and call your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you rightly said, for the man you are with is not your husband. And it was as if someone used a highlighter pen and marked out those words. The man you are with is not your husband. And I said, Holy Spirit, rough play. <laughs> it's as simple as, I don't know how to explain it to you in American English. Rough play means rough play. <laughs> and that was how that relationship ended. Tears running down my eyes. I cried for months. I went from a size 16 to a size 12. I literally, it's UK size by the way, not US size. I literally, because somebody's saying, 18, 12, that's not so much. <laughs> I literally disappeared. Not knowing that God was working. Somebody say God was working. And so through my tears, I told God, I will obey you, but I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me. Bypass my emotions and do what is best for me. I will cry, but I will obey you. It will hurt, but I will obey you. If you say this is not him, then there has to be someone. And I said something. I said, Lord, the same way you told me who it's not is the way you're going to tell me who it is. 
And so, not long after that, Pastor Kay and I became friends. <laughs> and then one day, I couldn't go to my church. And I went to, by that time, he was pastoring. So I went to his church. Um, and when I got there, I was like, funny enough, I went to the church. I wasn't sure he was for real. Because when I knew him, he was a bad boy. Went to school together. <laughs> and he was, we're, we're in high school together. He was already carrying a pistol in high school. Trying to kill people. He was smoking weed, all kinds of things. And then 10 years later, somebody says, that guy is a pastor. So I was wondering, is this one of those scams? And I have the spirit of God. So if I go to his church, I'll know for sure if he is a true man of God. Well, he wasn't going to be my pastor anyway, so I didn't really care, but he was my friend. So I got there and he was preaching. I was like, ah, this guy actually is a man of God. And so after the service, he walks up to me and says, oh, you came to church today? I was like, I didn't know you saw me. And by the way, for those of you that don't know, the pastor sees all of you, no matter where you're sitting. So sitting at back doesn't really help you. So, <laughs> so he came to me and said, okay, you know what? I'll take you home, but I have a pastor's meeting. So he was in his pastor's meeting and I, was, I just sat somewhere and I just felt that same unusual presence of God. I knew God wanted to talk to me. So I just sat there thinking, this church has such a strong anointing. And then I started reading about where um, Samuel went to anoint one of Jesse's sons. And then he got there. I'm giving you a very average version. He got there, and then he said, is there no, because all the guys had passed before him, and there was no one. He said, is there no more? And they said, there remained one. He's the youngest, and he's taking care of the sheep. And then when they brought him, the Holy Spirit said, arise and anoint him, for he's the one. The same thing happened again. That same highlight happened. And then the Lord asked me a question. He said, what position is Kingsley in his family? I said, he's the youngest. And he said, what do pastors do? I said, they take care of the sheep. He said, arise, anoint him for his one. And so God did something. Now, I like the fact that you're clapping now, but Pasquale didn't look like this then. <laughs> so when the Lord said to me, I said to him again, rough play. <laughs> I said, God, there are things I've told you I want. I told you I don't want to marry a pastor. I told you I don't want to marry a man that is hairy. I told you I don't want to marry a man that is Igbo. And I told you I don't want to marry a man that is feminine complexion. And the Lord just packaged everything nicely into a sandwich and said, here, take a bite. <laughs> and for me at the time, it was a huge sacrifice. But you know what I found out? Because I decided to marry for God, for kingdom, and for duty, look what God is doing with us today. 